Summer 2017. German authorities announced that they'd broken up a major child pornography platform which was coordinated in Germany. The platform allowed users to exchange child pornography worldwide and to arrange meetings that involved actual sexual abuse of children aged between 2 and 8. Prosecutors confirmed that the platform had 87,000 members. Some parents are said to have used the site to offer their own children for abuse. There's been a sharp rise in child pornography investigations in recent years. We wanted to find out who downloads this material. Michael, a self-confessed pedophile, agreed to talk to us. When I realized that I had pedophilic tendencies, it became a real problem for me. I was disgusted with myself. Michael is now in a therapy program that helps him to control those tendencies. Our research for this report took us to the Philippines, home to a flourishing international trade in child pornography. How can the perpetrators be stopped? And how can potential victims be protected? Our report begins in Karlsruhe. This is Judge Klaus Böhm. Böhm and his colleagues are frustrated that they can't do more to crack down on child pornography. They can lock up perpetrators, but that won't really change things. Böhm says that therapy for offenders offers the best protection for potential victims. And he set up an organization that provides that therapy. Can pedophilia, this tendency or illness, be treated successfully? It's a lifelong sickness, but it is possible to learn to deal with it. They can get into a therapy program. And in that program, the person concerned can learn to avoid high-risk situations that could trigger an episode of abuse. For example, if a pedophile becomes sexually aroused when he looks into a child's eyes, he'll learn in therapy not to do that. Michael is taking part in Judge Berm's therapy program. Police are investigating him for possession and production of child pornography. Michael knows that most people believe that pedophiles are perverted child molesters and should be locked up. He is willing to break his silence if we don't disclose his identity. Michael is married. He says he loves his wife and is physically attracted to her. But he also has a dark side. He is attracted to children as well. When did you first become aware of this? Very early on, at the age of 18, 19 or 20, I became increasingly attracted to much younger girls. That wasn't a problem when I was 14 or 15 and looking at 7th graders. Yeah. But as I got older, I became more aware of it. So your interest in young girls was sort of frozen in time? Yes. It all started with me looking at photos of nudists on the beach. And then it became more and more extreme. I started looking at things that really disgusted me. Have you ever thought about what the boys and girls that you saw in those photos were going through, the damage being done to them? Of course. 
Das verstärkt dann noch weiter die die Schuld. And that adds to the guilt and shame. Bei den bei diesen Posingbildern kann man das. When I looked at post photos, it's easier to ignore the thoughts because I know that the pictures are staged. I can't see what happened before or after the photos were taken. I just see what's there. But those children didn't exactly pose for those photos willingly, did they? No, by then, by the mis. No. That was clear in material that portrayed physical abuse, or were the children engaged in autoerotic behavior. When you experience guilt, shame, and sexual arousal at the same time, it's a very dangerous combination. Michael says he's never touched a child indecently. The therapy program is aimed at keeping him from ever doing that. I've got to get my act together. This situation could ruin my life. How can children be protected against sexual abuse? Experts estimate that one percent of all men have pedophilic tendencies. That would mean at least 250,000 pedophiles live in Germany. Pedophilia is a psychiatric disorder in which adults are sexually attracted to prepubescent children. But most pedophiles do not actually abuse children. Their attraction is confined to fantasies. And almost all pedophiles look at child pornography. German police investigate an estimated 2,000 such cases a year. Ute Prefka is a police inspector in Karlsruhe. Prefka analyzes and documents child pornography that's been seized in raids. She says the amount of material and the number of suspects is increasing. She loads terabytes of material into the police computer system. It takes weeks and sometimes months to evaluate a single case. Prefka has been doing this job for 14 years. She tries to keep her work from affecting her opinion of people in general and men in particular. But she says it's not always easy. Every day, Prefka has to examine material that reflects the very depths of human depravity. She gets psychological counseling to help her cope. Some of the worst material involves the sexual abuse of children. It's powerful stuff, because the videos really do show actual abuse. I've seen videos where the child is crying and being treated like a mere object, shoved around and physically and sexually abused. The scope of the abuse is just awful. Prefka documents the material so that it can be used as evidence in court. Every video must be viewed and described in detail. The time-consuming nature of the work, coupled with the shortage of police and court staff, means that it often takes years to bring the perpetrators to trial. A five to six year old girl poses in front of the camera. Change of scene. You see the suspects while they're being questioned. Most people would describe them as utterly depraved. Would you agree with that? No. Most of these people have serious psychological problems, and they fall into all sorts of different categories. We see that when we do searches in connection with an investigation. A suspect once told me, I'm glad you guys caught me. It's given me the impetus to get into a therapy program. He was really relieved. Prefka encourages suspects to sign up for therapy. Studies show that pedophiles who view pornographic videos are more likely to lose their inhibitions. An estimated one in four eventually turns to actual physical abuse. But direct intervention can stop this progression, say therapists. EU member states are required to set up a comprehensive therapy network. Germany hasn't done that yet. 
And that's why Judge Klaus Böhm set up his own organization called BIOS. He aims to help victims of sexual violence and the people who commit these crimes, or those who fear that they might. We've had feedback from people who've spent a year with us. They say that if it weren't for us, they'd still be watching child porn videos and hanging around at playgrounds. They say the program helps them to deal with their disorder. The judge's organization has evaluated and treated 2,500 men over the past eight years. And it has a good success record, according to the therapists. In severe cases, doctors prescribe drugs to reduce the patient's sex drive. But that is the exception rather than the norm. For the majority of participants, the key part of the therapy program involves teaching them to develop empathy so that they can understand the suffering of child abuse victims. But what do those victims think about the crimes that were committed against them? Thomas Schlingmann was abused as a child by his father. It was decades before he could finally talk about it. Now he runs a self-help group in Berlin. Tonight, a new group of abuse victims will be meeting here. We agree not to film them, to preserve their anonymity. The tat is absolute heftig. These are violent crimes that deprive people of their humanity. Everyone has a will of their own, and they have their own particular needs. But the perpetrators ignore all that. They reduce children to objects that they can use as they like. It's appalling. Schlingmann debated for years whether he should take legal action against his father. But by the time he finally decided to do so, the statute of limitations had run out. He founded the self-help group as part of his effort to deal with his experiences. Michael has never sexually abused a child himself. But by downloading child pornography, he has supported an industry that does abuse and exploit children around the world. I was always afraid of being caught right from the beginning, when I started downloading the stuff. And then the police showed up. They searched the house and confiscated my computer. I had to make an official statement. What did the police find? Videos, tens of thousands of pictures. I'd been collecting material for years. Photos and video? Right. One aggravating factor was that the police also found photographs that you'd taken yourself. Tell us how that came about. I was on vacation in Thailand. I had the opportunity to take some pictures, so I did. But that opportunity didn't just happen by chance. Right. I met some people and got to know them a little. And that's how I ended up taking pictures of the children. We've come to The Hague to find out more about an initiative that uses unusual methods to combat online child pornography. In Asia, for example, children are abused in front of web cameras, and lots of people are willing to pay to watch. An international children's rights organization called Terre des Hommes uses a digital trap to snare the perpetrators. They've created a computer avatar, an image of a Filipino girl called Sweetie, which is used as a decoy. The avatar is uploaded to teenage chat rooms where pedophiles are looking for potential victims. Victor is running the operation today. Again and again, men offer money to have sex with Sweetie. They've been duped into thinking that they're dealing with a real child. 
not an adult who's trying to bust them. Victor tries to get the men to provide their names, email addresses and account numbers. They all don't respond now. This sting operation has led to the arrest and conviction of several no, thousand no. perpetrators. We've agreed to protect Victor's identity, but his supervisor, Hans, agrees to talk no. to us. Hans, for me it was shocking to see that only 10 seconds after you enter a chat room, things like this happen. You see the half-naked man, you see men masturbating. Is yeah. this, I mean, these are not porn sites, these no. are just children's this is, this chat is, rooms. This is a public area of the internet, a public chat room, and there are thousands of these chat rooms. And uh, the moment you go, on, you go in one of these chat rooms, and you state that you're an you know, 11 or 12 year old girl from the, from the Philippines, they just jump on you, they swamp on you. It's just unbelievable. So you want to put pressure on them? Absolutely, because uh, in fact, it's nearly impossible, nearly impossible to uh, convict these, these individuals. These kids are either doing it, you know, to keep themselves alive, or they're being forced by pimps or by gangs or by their parents to do this kind of work. They won't come forward. You don't have a victim. This is live streaming, live streaming. The moment you switch off your computer, the evidence is gone. No victim, no witness, no evidence, no case. So it's virtually impossible. Therefore, proactive, preventive is a much better approach to tackle this 21st century form of, uh, of sexual exploitation of children. But evidence that's obtained in this way is not allowed in German courts. Terre des Hommes is also trying to expose the structure of the child pornography market in the Philippines. They're doing that with the help of Belgian journalist Peter Dupont. We're now on our way to Southeast Asia. Dupont has been doing research in the Philippines for months and has managed to infiltrate various computer networks that cater to paedophiles. It's on dating sites like um, this one that people who are offering cyber sex are looking for customers. Um, they know that it's a dangerous activity, so it takes quite some time to gain their trust. People are offering you what they call a show, and the show is a sex show. So they show you anything you want. And if you really ask more or wait, then they will offer you a show with young, meaning uh, children. Peter takes us to a slum in Manila and explains how and why online abuse has turned into a thriving business here. Internet access is cheap, and many of the children speak at least a little English. That makes it easier for pedophiles to make contact. Peter shows us a place where children are forced to appear in front of webcams. He goes online and claims to be someone who's looking for sex with children, and he quickly gets an offer. A few days later, Peter visits the new child abuse prevention unit that's been set up by the Philippines National Police. Catherine Tamayo and her colleagues are doing their best to crack down on child pornography on the internet. She's appalled by some of the images. This material is available worldwide on the so-called dark net, where you can operate anonymously online. The videos are bought, sold and traded on forums. The sheer number of transactions is alarming.
Last summer, German prosecutors and federal police shut down a platform that had an estimated 87,000 users around the world. But only a few of those users are under investigation. 87,000 users and only 14 suspects? Shouldn't we be talking about 87,000 suspects? The 87,000 users are spread across the globe. Darknet investigations are very complex and labor-intensive, and there is no guarantee that those investigations will produce results. It's like working with a huge jigsaw puzzle. Four alleged perpetrators are now in custody, but many of those who have exchanged child pornography on the platform will probably go unpunished. It's difficult to secure evidence on the dark net, not least because it requires complicated international police cooperation. Thomas Schlingmann has made helping child abuse victims his life's work. He's not fundamentally opposed to programs that treat the perpetrators, but he suspects that many of them sign up for help because they think the authorities will go easy on them. Of course they do it for tactical reasons. That's obvious. Therapy might work for some of them, but for most of these guys, it's in one ear and out the other. And some therapists provide them with a clean bill, saying this guy was in my treatment program and now he's okay. That's how convicted offenders gain access to children again. This happens in family courts, for example. That's completely unacceptable. And if I look to see how many perpetrators are classed as pedophiles, it seems to me that the majority of child abusers are not pedophiles at all, according to this definition. Indeed, police statistics indicate that most men accused of child abuse do not fit the clinical definition of pedophile. So who are these perpetrators and what drives them? Many sex offenders prey on victims who are extremely vulnerable, like children. Many perpetrators take sadistic pleasure in subjecting their victims to violence. But experts say that those who prey on children indiscriminately are the exception. In most cases, the victim is known to the perpetrator. This is important information for investigators. Peter Dupont's research confirms that not all paedophiles become physically abusive. But there is a connection between paedophiles and child abusers. Child pornography can open the door to more dangerous behavior. Dupont visits a children's home to interview boys and girls who not only had to undress in front of webcams, but were also physically abused by sex tourists, including some from Germany. The evidence indicates that the perpetrators traveled to the Philippines specifically for sex and took advantage of children who've been forced to appear on internet shows by relatives or criminal gangs. The family business with the much younger kids, they're much more in demand, the younger. And when uh, you um, carry out you know, really aggressive sex shows, involving rape or involving animals that are very po popular, then we're talking like three, four hundred dollars. That's a lot of money. That's a small fortune for the Philippines. And so you have to do something about the demand side. Otherwise, this thing is going completely out of control. Meanwhile, Dupont has handed over his data to the investigators. They now have an overview of the structure of the International Child Pornography Network including distribution channels, customers, and payment options. I, I feel really repulsed. These are really very young kids, and um, their exploitation is, uh, for me, shocking, even at my level as a law enforcement officer already. For days, Officer Tamayo has been using a webcam to monitor a cyber sex house. 
The police will try to free the children from the house today. It's the first raid of its kind in the Philippines. The police found 12 children here. The youngest was a nine-year-old girl. All of them had appeared on webcams for Western customers. Most of the children had also been physically abused. Police arrested the pimps and their accomplices and seized credit cards and computers. The boys and girls were taken to a children's home to help them get back to some semblance of normality. But who knows whether they will ever recover from their ordeal. It will be much more difficult to track down and arrest the five suspects' international customers. The victims have testified in court and have identified some of the people who abused them. But the legal process could take years to complete. Police in Manila still have to sift through mountains of evidence. It's not clear whether any German suspects will be brought to justice. Michael, the man who photographed naked children in Thailand, is still awaiting trial. It's been almost four years since he was questioned by police but he has completed a therapy program. I think I've made progress, although I still have some fantasies. But now I know how to handle them, and it works surprisingly well. I'm moving in the right direction now, and that's a great feeling. But what about the victims? All too often, they are left alone to deal with their experiences. But there are signs of hope. There are people who've been devastated by this. They can't get back on their feet. They feel abandoned. Some end up in psychiatric care. Others commit suicide. And we can't forget that. But there are just as many other people who've managed to find a way out of it. Society as a whole has to help these victims, whether it's through various programs or simply by listening to them and getting involved. That will provide recovery opportunities for many. People don't have to suffer for the rest of their lives. I think it's a good thing that so many of them are now standing up and saying, I'm not going to stay a victim. That's a path to change.